Hello everyone this is part 7 of what if Naruto got his wish, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. To say that Hanata was on cloud 9 was an understatement. Her day had begun as normally as it ever did these times. She woke up shortly after dawn, practiced with Neji Nisan, ate breakfast, meditated to practice her chakra control in the garden, checked with Hokage Sama to see if there were any missions for her, went to the market. A perfectly routine morning. However, that was where the normalcy ended. On her way home from the market, she had met her beloved Naruto-kun and his friends at Keisuke-san's new home, and Naruto had agreed, whether or not it was out of boredom, she did not know, and now in the afterglow of the glorious day did not care, to join her and her teammates for their afternoon practice. She had borne witness to Naruto's new and fascinating skill, watched him defeat her teammate Shino against difficult odds, and, this part brought the red color back to her face, glanced at his unclothed torso, a memory which would linger forever and give her even stranger dreams than normal tonight. Best of all, Naruto had seen her practice match, and, though admittedly he was distracted throughout most of it, he had looked her in the eyes and confessed that he had liked what he'd seen. He'd called it, awesome, and, amazing, and given her that glorious smile that she loved so much. All of Hanata's dreams of changing herself from a hesitant, weak person into a strong woman worthy of acknowledgement had now been realized. She had her father's respect, the village's open support, Neji Nisan's willing help, and now she had her Naruto-kun's acknowledgement and even his lavish praise. If an enemy shinobi had hacked her to pieces that very moment, she almost would not have cared. The fact that Naruto was walking next to her on her way home was icing on the cake. Her still dominant shy aspect prevented her from singing her happiness, but that was fine, since Naruto seemed to be able to do enough talking for the both of them. He cheerfully went on and on and on about a seemingly endless number of topics, including the difficulties during his match with Shino, the similarities between that match and another battle that he'd fought during his travels, further praise for Hanata's excellent performance, more blushing, similarities and differences between her and his friend Haruka, whom Hanata had not yet met, the entertainment value of the rivalry between Haruka and Keisuke. It's really funny, the lengths they'll go to to make each other look inferior, he said. Haruka beats Keisuke, and Keisuke genjutsus her in a random public place so that she hears things and flips out. Keisuke beats Haruka, and he wakes up wondering why everyone is staring at him funny until Jiraiya asks what that picture of him. Hanata giggled softly at that remark and kept listening to him, all her cares forgotten, as he went on to explain how Keisuke was such a great guy, if a little over-relaxed in his free time, how he taught Naruto all about the Rokujuyon road, how versatile it was, and how awesome it would be if it were, as he thought, a bloodline limit jutsu. Hanata wondered about this last part herself. If he bears his own kekai genkai, then because he is an orphan, he is the heir to its legacy, that puts him on a politically equal level with me. She tuned Naruto out for a little while, caught up in daydreams involving a politically arranged marriage that would eventually turn into a passionate love, as she let her imagination run rampant, her thoughts raised more be to her face and caused her blonde companion to look at her with concern. He brought his blue eyes level with hers and said, hey, Hanata, you sick or something? You're turning an interesting neon red there. Hanata shook her head, insisting truthfully that nothing was wrong. Things could not be going more right, she thought. Naruto kept his eyes warily on her for a moment, then continued talking. All right, so anyway, the road is great for a lot of things, and I don't think I even know half of its uses yet. So far, I know Tomashibi no Kyubi, Keisuke's Kokuan seals, trap seals, Keisuke says I'm pretty creative with those, the arms make great motion senses, too, and then there's those elemental lightning strikes, you saw me use one of those on Shino. Um, oh, yeah. The synchronization technique. Hanata was curious about this one, and about the enthusiastic manner in which Naruto mentioned it. Synchronization, Naruto-kun. Yeah, he said. It's awesome when you use it with the right person. Keisuke and Haruka do it all the time, when they aren't harassing each other. It gives both people complete access to their combined chakra pull, 
and they can even feel, see, and hear everything that the other person does. The way it works, the person with the reud sticks some of his arms into the other person's tenkatsus and then. Ano, Naruto kun. Hanata interrupted gently. Naruto was surprised at the polite interruption. Hanata had been practically silent through the whole trip. But he shrugged it off and smiled at her, eager to explain the arcane workings of his and Keisuke's unique arts. What's up, Hanata? Got a question. Yes. Um, how can you link the arms between your tenkatsus and the other person's if, if you can't see them? Good question, Naruto said. Not even I really have the hang of it yet. Keisuke says that the best way to do it is let the arms themselves tell you what to do. Meaning that since you know where your own tenkatsus are by where your ghostly arms are attached, you can imagine where they are on the other person and feel them out easily. He says that if you do it often enough it becomes an automatic thing, where you can find them without really thinking about it. I guess I'm not at that point yet, though. He grinned sheepishly, unaccustomed to admitting his own shortcomings. One day, though, I'll get it, he said, and once I've got the perfect partner, maybe Kakashi Sensei or Sakura, we'll have enough power between us to beat the crap out of Orokimaru. I'll bring Sasuke back without a problem. Hanata had been about to calmly, offhandedly, or as close to such as the shy girl might have gotten, suggest synchronizing with a Byakugan user like Keisuke, but at the mention of Sasuke, she stopped. She remembered the conversation that Naruto had had with Kakashi Sensei, the one that she had eavesdropped on. She remembered the worry she had felt for Naruto, remembered acting like nothing was wrong all the way to practice while she inwardly prayed that he would come through this mess alive and whole. Uchiha Sasuke almost K Naruto kun the last time they met. If they meet again, fight again, at their level, there will be no, almost, this time. This line of thinking progressed down its dark path only a few moments longer before Hanata stopped it. Worrying for Naruto's safety would not do anything to his benefit. She knew that bringing Uchiha back into the light was very important to him, and he would not relent until he had done it. It's a promise of a lifetime, Sakura-chan. I'm not going to take back my words. That's my Nindo. It is my Nindo as well, Naruto-kun, she thought. Naruto's fist was still raised in a silent oath, renewing the promise to retrieve Sasuke or D. She brought her small hands up to the fist and clasped it. The reaction was immediate. Naruto jerked his head towards her with surprise on his face, which multiplied when he saw her serious eyes boring into him. It was an intense gaze, one that he had seen only one time before, moments before their first Chunin examination, when Hanata had insisted that he was not a regular dropout, but a proud failure who became stronger because of his mistakes. He had had a similar reaction then. His eyes had gone wide, almost in shock, as they did now. There were differences between that time and this one, this time, Hanata's pleading outburst was physical, not verbal. Last time, they had stood a good ten feet away, at least. This time, she was right there in front of him. Last time, Naruto's mental response was four words, damn, Hanata's pretty cool. This time, it had been shortened to only three words, damn, Hanata's pretty. He lowered his fist to side, and Hanata's hands followed it, clinging to it, gently demanding that he pay attention. Naruto-kun. Eh hey hey, yeah, Hanata. Naruto-kun, I, when you were speaking to Kakashi-sensei earlier, I was listening. Now she didn't to touch him to get his attention. His eyes were riveted to her now, a situation that she almost would have K for on any less serious occasion. His face had darkened slightly. So, you know, huh. Yes. Naruto-kun, I never liked Sasuke-san much, but. Who would? Naruto said, his voice uncharacteristically quiet. He's a bastard, a traitor, a genius who thinks he's ended to everything, who'll sell out anyone, even himself, just K his own brother. He trailed off, apparently in some mental distress. Hanata took the opportunity to continue speaking. I never liked him much, but I know how important it is to you to bring him back, him being your teammate and all. Naruto couldn't say anything, his face growing darker still, his eyes falling from her towards the ground at his feet. She knew he was reliving his last encounter with Sasuke, playing it over and over in his mind until he grew emotionally sick. I also know how dangerous it could be to save him, and, well, I worry for you, Naruto-kun. Naruto's head lifted back into her eyes. Hanata, you worry about me. Hanata's face rapidly turned pink. 
Ah, uh, yes, Naruto-kun, because. Of course, Naruto said, knocking himself in the head with his free hand as if remembering something that was common knowledge, it's because we're such great friends. How did I forget that? I'd have worried about you if Kiba were out to KU, or some such thing. Hanata just stared for a moment, dumbstruck. It seemed that even though Naruto had matured in mind and body, there was still much left over in his, common knowledge, that differed from everyone else's. Hanata, however, still could not overcome her shy aspect to correct him. Anyway, you don't have to worry about me, he went on, if I'm right, Sasuke has enough good left in him to not K me right away. I'll have the chance to talk him out of, whatever it is he plans on doing. Hanata smiled wanly at him. I'm sure that you can do it, Naruto-kun, she said, but. Thata girl. Naruto exclaimed, I knew if I couldn't count on anyone else to have faith in me, I could still count on you. Slightly exasperated at all the interruptions, Hanata raised her voice a decibel, something that she almost never did, though now she felt it necessary. Naruto-kun. He shut up. Once again, his eyes were large with surprise, and he was listening intently. Satisfied, Hanata continued, I know I can't stop you from doing this dangerous thing, and I know that you have the strength to do it. But I also know that Sasuke-san might be very strong as well, we don't know for sure, but he could be far more powerful than you. If you cannot talk him down. I know you are truly strong, Naruto-kun, and there is nobody who can deny that anymore. But I won't be able to stop worrying until it's over with, unless I am there with you. Naruto's blue pupils focused with the intensity of laser beams into her own pleading white eyes. She knew he was seeking for the true motivation. Was he beginning to suspect? It didn't matter now. While she had his attention, she had to finish making her case. Not only for you, Naruto-kun. Sakura-chan is mixed up in this, too, she said. Deep within herself, she wages an inner war, Part of her knows that Sasuke-san betrayed her and everyone in the village, and wants to stay away, and the other part, the part that prevails right now, believes that he can be saved, and because she loves him still, she clings to this belief and strengthens herself for the trouble ahead. Sakura-chan is my friend, Naruto-kun, and so, so are you. Both of you will go to extremes to take Sasuke-san back, and I worry that it will be the end of you. I don't want it to be. Her eyes were glistening now with unshed tears. Still they held Naruto, commanded his deference to her fears. I want to help you too, Naruto-kun. For your sake and, and for mine. Her voice slowly lowered until it was almost a whisper. As she finished her head drooped, her mind exhausted by the emotional effort. Her hands still held his clenched fist tightly, but she had no more to say, the hands demanded his speech now, rather than his attention. He was at loggerheads with himself. Hanata's offer was good and kind, and Naruto would rather have given up ramen for three days than refuse a kind offer from a pretty girl, especially after such an impassioned plea. On the other hand, though, Hanata was a good person with her whole, rich life ahead of her and, as he was growing ever more aware, beautiful, it would be a shame to see her throw away her life. For a while they merely stood there on the street, alone except for the flickering of the night lamps, coming on as the sun began to set. Hanata waited patiently as Naruto turned things over in his mind, weighing the merits of accepting her help and of refusing. As the silence dragged on, her grip on his fist tightened. What am I supposed to say? He asked. He was saved from his decision, for the moment, by the appearance of a short young man in clothing similar to Naruto's, who dropped from the street lamp he'd been perching on. He landed awkwardly and had to catch himself with one hand to keep from hitting his face on the pavement. Both Naruto and Hanata turned to face him, mutely surprised at his sudden dropping in. Ah, said the young man, picking himself up, I'm still not used to my normal body, damn it. He was pale in complexion, had long, straight black hair, and bland facial features that wouldn't have looked out of place in any crowd. Hanata gasped lightly in recognition. Ah, you are one of those copies, the mass-produced doppelgangers who took Naruto-kun's form to attack the village. Naruto stared, so that's what they really looked like. No234, at your service, said the former Naruto clone, bowing clumsily. Why are you here? asked Hanata, watching him warily and looking for indicators of hostility. Now, now, Hugo-san, replied O234, I've been questioned enough, I think. Ask Abiki yourselves, 
he'll tell you that I've spilled just about everything for your sakes. He paused, then grinned ominously. Well, almost everything. Neither Naruto nor Hanata relaxed. Quit trying to mess with our heads, or I'll show you how my head can mess with you, said the blonde. Sabaku no Gara can tell you all about how that feels. The grin dropped from N234's face. He sighed. All right. First I'll tell you why I didn't tell Ibiki what I'm about to tell you, he began. Now listen, the Uchiha is here on Orokimaru's behalf, as you could have guessed. He's been sent as a response to a message sent by a political figure in Kanoa, one that wants to ally with Orokimaru to crush Kanoa, for reasons that grunts like me aren't told. No. 234 had told Ibiki these things, but all this information was new to Naruto. His face was screwed up, thinking over the words, absorbing the information. Keep talking. The former clone nodded. Now, this guy that I don't know provides the Uchiha with all the information that Kanoa's council has that he needs, such as what shinobi are deployed where at any given time, who the Hokage is meeting with, what decisions are being made, and what information is being tortured out of prisoners. Now, I know that I'm going to be K-off anyway, said the clone, at which Hanata and Naruto started. He held up his hand to silence them. Listen, it's the truth. Uchiha and his accomplices don't let those of us who get captured live. They assassinate him to prevent us from spilling, or, if it's too late for that, they do it to get revenge for our spilling. I knew that I'd be D the moment they got a chance, so I decided to spill as much as I could. But I held one thing back, for a good reason. Since the Uchiha knows everything that Kanoa knows, he'd be able to evacuate before the village mustered a raiding party. I thought it would be better if I held off on telling the whole village, and instead try to tell you, the one person that the Uchiha doesn't count on to know anything, and so isn't spying on. A change came over Naruto. He was shaking with excitement, and his eyes were bright with hope. Evacuate, he asked in a voice that trembled like his body, where? Where? The grin returned. The place where I, along with my 1,000 odd brothers, every one of us bred from genetically manipulated Kedwai Clan B, were born into the world with the purpose of wreaking havoc. Orokimaru's old laboratory. All right, Naruto half shouted. I'm going to tell Kakashi Sensei and Sakura, and we'll go in after that bastard first thing tomorrow. Hey, hey, said 0234, there's no guarantee that he's still there. There's no guarantee that he was ever there, really. That's just where we were all made. I'm saying that, because I didn't spill that fact, the Uchiha doesn't have any pressing reason to abandon the facility. There might be something there, there might not. But since you don't have any leads, he finished, I figure it would be the best place to get one. Hey, thanks, Mr. Ah, uh, whatever you are, said Naruto appreciatively. He had a big smile on his face now. No. 234 Naruto clone number 234, he replied. It's not a problem. I don't have any love for my creator, and this is the best way to be useful to his enemies before he gets me. He shrugged. I will warn you, though, he may not personally be there, but the manpower that he can create with those machines down there may prove overwhelming. Take all the backup you can get without making a big noise about it. I understand, said the blonde. Ah, good luck. Luck. Right said the clone bitterly. Like I'll need it in the afterlife. The only consolation I need from you is the death of my creator. Don't worry. I'll make sure that bastard pays his dues. You do that, kid, said the former clone as he walked away. You do that. They watched him go. Both Naruto and Hanata stood in silence another moment, contemplating the sad nature and horrible destiny he'd been born into. All a product of Sasuke's darkness, the child of Orokimaru's evil. He'll get what's coming to him, Naruto swore, that's a promise. Hanata looked at him, a question in her eyes. Naruto-kun. You know, Hanata, Naruto said, you're really a great person. It would be really sad if you got hurt following me into this. He's going to turn my offer down, she thought. Balling up her hands into pained fists, she prepared speak her grudging acceptance of his decision. But then, Naruto continued, a smile crossing his once dark face, he did say to bring all the backup I can get without making a big noise, and I think I can trust you to keep this pretty quiet, any, Hanata. Hanata looked into his eyes, not quite believing. Was he going to? Naruto-kun. Hanata, he said, 
If I'm going down into a rat's nest like the snake bastard's old labs, I'll need good eyes to watch my back. So you're going to have to come with me after all. The pale-eyed young woman in front of him lit up like a light bulb after a blackout. The extraordinary happy look on her face spread to his. Ironic, he thought. Normally I'm supposed to have the contagious energy. Naruto-kun, thank you. Hee <laughs> hee, that's better, Naruto said. I think I always liked you better smiling. I'm glad I'm letting you help, you would have been unhappy then, and unhappy people don't smile so well. He started down the street, heading towards Sakura's home. Come to the gates of the village around 9 tomorrow morning. I'll drag Kakashi Sensei there by his mask, if I have to, as long as he's on time. I will, Naruto kun. I promise. Hanata's face practically glowed. After all the great things that had happened today, now she would finally be of some real use to the young man that she admired. Naruto waved, shouted, Yarene, and ran off into the orange of the setting sun. Hanata's gaze rested on his retreating back for a moment, and then she, too, moved along. Boo. Emerging from the base of the tower, Haruka checked her map and began heading for her new lodgings. According to the Human Resources Department, it was one of the first buildings that had been completed in the new housing district being constructed near the outer edge of the village. Haruka noted glumly that it was placed far from and on the opposite side of the village from the Huga compound. While this served her well for safety purposes, it did not good to her spirit to be forced out of her ancestral home. Sighing, she put those thoughts out of her mind. Now was not the time to be moping about, now that she had Keisuke's support, it would be only a matter of time before that terrible system was out of place. Then, the branch would have no more reason to begrudge anyone, and in their newfound freedom, they would not notice or care if she walked in and took an empty room. This optimism carried her down the street with her head held high. She kept alert for Branch Huga light-heartedly as she strode toward her temporary home away from home. However, her trip was put on hold when she saw the young girl, the heiress to her clan, moving along towards her from the opposite end of the street that she was currently on. Matches the description perfectly, Haruka thought. No doubt about it, that's the one. So this is what she looks like all grown up. If Naruto-kun doesn't keel over in homage just looking at her, there's something wrong with the boy. Hanata was an important piece in the game that Keisuke was playing against the Huga system. Haruka stepped in front of the girl, bowing low. I am sorry that I have never done you proper honor before, she said, Hanata-sama. The younger Huga looked her over. She registered the braided black hair, the tall, slender figure, the glint in her white eye that suggested that she might be serious, or she might not. In a moment, Hanata recognized her for the person that Naruto had told her about, the one that had traveled with him and Keisuke and Jiraiya for two years. You are Haruka-san, aren't you? Hanata asked. Oh, so Naruto-kun has told you about me after all, hm? Said Haruka, rising from her bow and standing in a relaxed poise before her. Hi, he did. Are you enjoying being back home? Hanata caught the brief flicker of pain in Haruka's face. Clearly. Haruka was not enjoying herself in Kanoa. Soon enough, however, a cheerful look came back onto her mien, covering up whatever displeasure she had been thinking of. It's not so bad, she said with a dismissive wave of her hand. Although, Keisuke certainly seems to be having fun, have to remember to show him up later. Ah, but that's another story. It isn't every day that you meet your future clan head for the first time. No, Hanata said, I don't suppose it is. A slight smile spread onto her lips. This woman had the graces and the ability of the Huga, yet she possessed the easygoing, self-reliant attitude that was characteristic to Naruto, minus the tendency to be obnoxiously loud, of course. Hanata was beginning to like her. So, I've heard that you only recently were named the official successor, Haruka said. Am I correct, Hanata-sama? Hi, that is true, Hanata responded. Father announced it before the Kanoa Elder Council members last month. Congratulations. Haruka exclaimed, clapping the girl on the shoulder. I had thought that you would. There is no way that Keisuke and Naruto-kun would flap their mouths about it endlessly just so that we could come home and find out that you'd failed. Hanata flushed slightly upon hearing that Naruto had talked of her so proudly. Ah, thank you, Haruka-san. Now now, we can drop the, san, right there. Haruka said. 
Naruto-kun and I are great friends, and any friend of his is easily a friend of myself. I see. I understand, Haruka. That works, said the older Hyuga, grinning pleasantly. Now then, about this rumor I've heard. Hanata tensed. If this was the rumor that she was thinking of, and if she knew the evil look in Haruka's eye correctly, then this might not end well. Is it the truth that you have slept with Uzumaki Naruto-kun? The crash of Hanata's skull on the pavement was audible throughout a half-mile radius. Several people poked their heads out of their windows to get a better look. When they saw who it was, they shrugged and returned to their business, having seen this several times previously. Looks like someone's been making up yet more ridiculous Naruto s, they said to themselves. Haruka regarded her with amazement. Naruto is right, she really is weird around him. Judging from the thoroughly shocked nature of your reaction that the rumor is not true, she said. Oh of course it isn't Haruka. Hanata said, very flustered. Nonetheless, Haruka said, I have information from numerous sources, Keisuke, Sakura-san, and Ichiraku Chuki to name a few, that you wouldn't mind if someday it was true. No, I'm not finished yet, Hanata-sama. She held up her hand to silence the stuttering reply that Hanata had begun. As a member of the branch house, it is my responsibility to look out for your best interest. I can tell you truthfully that Naruto-kun holds you in very high regard, and considering all that he has told me of your past exploits, he does so for good reason. He respects you for the effort you put in to better yourself. That's one advantage you have. A contented grin found its way to Hanata's face as she remembered the afternoon's events. She certainly could not deny this point. You are one stunningly pretty girl. I have heard men and women alike of all ages in this village speak of it, and I see now that their admiration is well placed. That is your second advantage. This also Hanata could not deny. The number of cheerful compliments, jealous glances, and unqualified suitors that she had received spoke for itself. Haruka moved closer to her, put both hands on her shoulders, and lowered herself to eye level with the younger girl. If you act now, Hanata, you can have him without a fight. You are already in his good favor, all you need to do is push a little, and he will fall right into your arms. He has lost interest in Sakura-san over his absence, nobody can oppose you. Ah, but, Haruka, I, Hanata was having difficulty speaking. How did a simple first meeting between clanswomen turn into this? No one, not even Sakura, had spoken so urgently to her about Naruto. Yet she also knew, deep within herself, that nobody had ever spoken so truthfully. I have spoken to both Keisuke and Sakura-san, and they both agree that there is no better time than now, Haruka finished. I understand that for a shy person like you it might be difficult. But then, you've been able to overcome all your other obstacles so far. This is just one more hurdle to clear. The older Hyuga's words rang in Hanata's mind like a bell of hope. She could imagine triumph, victory, and the spoils that would be hers, if only she would just reach out and take them. Yet the old fear in the back of her mind fought that hope, lashed savagely at it. It was the fear of rejection, and it was a force that would not be denied. Hope had dawned too slowly this time, it could not get up enough momentum to drive it back. Hanata's voice was steady and quiet. I understand that you are trying to help me, she said, and I appreciate it. You are a good person, Haruka, but but you still do not think you're ready. H. Hi. Haruka sighed. The girl's shy aspect and fear of rejection were tough brick walls. Her words were as strong as the stream of a pressure washer, capable of flaying skin from bone. However, though she'd gotten through Hanata's skin, she would need a bulldozer before she could clear those brick walls. If you're not ready soon, she said, then someone else will begin to see him in the same light that you do, and then you will begin to lose hope. If that happens, you will never be ready. She shook her head in part faked, part real disappointment. A shame. I'd hoped that the clan would come out of this with two strong leaders rather than just one. But that isn't my place to decide, is it? Oh well. She acted as though she was about to leave, then faked remembering something. Oh. Hanata-sama, she said. If you're going to pass up the chance, I suppose I can at least offer you some consolation. She threw an envelope to Hanata, whose hand caught it by reflex. She saw the younger girl look down at it cautiously, it seemed that she somehow already knew what was in there and was afraid to look. Smiling, Haruka turned to leave once more, and found herself face to face with Keisuke, 
who was being guided by another young Hugo. The former smiled happily, apparently pleased with himself about something, while the latter tapped him on the shoulder, getting his attention. Haruka wondered what Keisuke was doing, letting himself be led around by this other Hugo. She flicked on her Byakugan, trying to find out what was going on with him. The young man said, Keisuke-san, Hanata-sama and another Hugo are here. Keisuke. Haruka gasped, your Reud is gone. How? I suppose I was too strong for my own good, Keisuke said, grinning maniacally. I'll be a registered Junin level shinobi by tomorrow. Just have to drop by the tower one last time in the morning. My Reud will have come back by then, there won't be any need to escort me. But you're blind now, hmm. Haruka said, you idiot, you burned up all your arms in one fight. No, not fighting, Keisuke said. I kept them during the skirmishes. I lost them performing, a final evasive maneuver. TCH, Haruka Mok scoffed, smiling haughtily at him. So you spent them running away. Lazy coward. Hey, Keisuke challenged. It was not cowardice, I was completing my mission objective. Pa, I heard that your objective was to take some poor man through a pack of tune into a clearly labeled exit. You can't have needed that much power to get through that. For your information, Keisuke growled, it was not only a pack of Chunin. Neji-san, who is a skilled Junin and probably the best Hugo fighter one have ever met, and a swarm of eye-gouging gnats were involved. Haruka, no longer faking annoyance, glared at him. The best Hugo fighter one have ever met. Neji-san. That was a direct insult aimed at her, and both knew it. Her white eyes crackled dangerously, a sight that would have frightened away lesser men. I gouging gnats, hmm. Keisuke's empty eye sockets glared right back at her. Unable to see Haruka's crackling eyes, he was unafraid. Yes. Neji and Hanata watched them nervously. Both could tell that if nobody intervened, things might not be pretty. Neji knew that Keisuke was in bad condition. To face such wrath now would not be good for him. Yet he could think of nothing to say that would stop them outright, so he thought it best that he and Hanata retreat for the moment. Clearing his throat loudly in the hope of distracting him, he turned to Hanata. Well, then, Hanata-sama, he said, I think we should be going now. We can leave Haruka-san to guide Keisuke-san home. I will escort you back to the Hyuga compound. Hanata, also sensing that withdrawal was best, agreed. Hi, I think that is a good idea, Neji-ni-san. Haruka-san, Keisuke-san, good night. Keisuke and Haruka had turned their heads to them. Good night, Hanata-san. Neji-san, an excellent match today. Thank you, Keisuke said. He saluted Neji, who nodded in response. Haruka came forward and took Hanata's hand. Good night, Hanata-chan. It was good to finally see you in person. Then she leaned forward and whispered, tell your father, at least, if you can't tell him. He'll need to know eventually, too. Having exchanged all the goodbyes, the two pairs parted ways, with Neji and Hanata moving back to the Hyuga compound. Keisuke and Haruka were left to themselves. I am not going to waste my time leading you home, blind idiot, Haruka said. Ha, huh, I wasn't going to suggest that you do. I don't need your help, anyway. This was mostly true, he was learning again to navigate as he used to, before he had obtained the road. He had accepted Neji's guidance as courtesy. He could stumble home by himself. They stood apart and glared at each other a moment longer, then they relaxed, exasperated. Both were tired, and there were other things to speak of. Keisuke started off. I see you've been working on Hanata-chan already, any luck? Haruka sighed heavily. Not that I can see. She knows that what I say is right, but she lacks the will to follow through. Keisuke nodded. As I expected. Don't worry about it. You are an older, more experienced woman, and a fellow Hugo to boot. Your words will have an impact in good time. And Neji-san is with us now, too. He will help where he can. Haruka stared hollowly at him. There was doubt in her voice. You really think this will work? Yeah, I really do, Keisuke said. Fear of rejection is a powerful barrier, but it's been beaten before. Hanata is more than strong enough to beat it herself. She just needs to realize that strength, as she did when she first endeavored to change herself. I have as much faith in her as I do in Naruto, after all, they share the same Nindo. Haruka felt a little more at ease now. She knew that Keisuke was right, and had all along. 
It was just the despair from earlier trying to drown her, the dark water fell all around her, on top of her, splashed her body, soaked her to the bone, but she did not have to drink it. All right, partner, I'll have a little more faith, she said. Her smile, though not seen by his sightless gaze, was picked up on nonetheless in her tone. Keisuke got the message. Keisuke started toward her, his own smile visible. Haruka. She turned and started walking away. You're still finding your own way home, though, blind idiot. Keisuke stumbled and nearly fell. Damn that woman. I'm at least three centuries old, thanks to being encased in that block of ice, she ought to respect her elders. He sighed and began trudging back to his own house. He thought of his ambitions, old and new, his new existence in this village, and how the tapestry was all woven together. When he reached his gate, he thought, Hyashi, Neji tells me you've softened up. I'd like to believe it's true, since you've finally embraced your daughter, but you still haven't done away with that barbaric system. You could have saved me a lot of trouble by K both birds with the same stone. Keisuke left his gate locked and continued down the now empty street. It seemed that he still had one more visit to pay before this long day ended. The second garden of the Hugo compound, bathed in evening twilight, was tranquil, secure, and beautiful. The small waterwheel turned and turned again, generating its repeat wooden clunk accompanied by the low, continuous splash of water. Put together with the symphonic ringing of the wind chimes in the summer breeze, the ambience was very calming. Orange light from the setting sun illuminated the clouds on the horizon, reflecting off of the greenery and completing the peaceful serenity of the place. Nearer to the village, however, hovering over the shops and the houses and the government buildings remained the ominous black clouds that had been there since the day had dawned. They still had not released a single drop of precipitation. It seemed as though they might be waiting for some unheard signal from a distant god or demon, whose plans of mayhem, or divine justice, depending on the nature of the deity, did not yet call for the storm to strike. These dark were, with one other exception, the only thing that disturbed the peace of the evening. The other exception sat contemplatively on at one end of the garden, from which one could look upon the whole of the tranquil scene with a solid, protective wall of hedge behind him, shielding him from the world, locking him in the moment. But he did not look over the garden, he looked within himself. Though the hedges could keep him safe from the cares of the outside world, there was no escape from the baggage that rode on his person, fixed firmly in his mind. He thought of his old friend's return, about how her fellows had been so volatile to her, and what this all symbolized. Was it an omen, a reflection of bigger, more terrible events yet to transpire? Would there be retribution upon Haruka for her father's mistake, or could it be revenge against the branch for their mistreatment of Haruka? Haruka, he said softly, you had nothing to do with your father's cowardly retreat or the S that followed. But I can do nothing to stop her the anger of the branch. They are beyond your control, suggested a voice above and behind him, too steeped in their fury to be held in thrall by a command. Could it be, Hugo Hyashi, that you are not as much the head of your clan as you once believed you were? Hyashi did not need to look to know who the speaker was. So, he said calmly, you've returned with her, have you? Then the rumors were truth. Keisuke climbed down the hedge, being careful not to lose his hold and crash into some unseen piece of garden art on the ground below. When he had touched down, he ambled around clumsily, looking for something to rest upon. Finding a rock by the pond near Hyashi, he plopped down upon it with a relieved sigh. Hyashi noted that the blind man was moving rather less easily than the last time they had met, but chose not to make a comment. Keisuke, firmly situated, answered, rumors. If you'd known I was on my way, Hyashi, then I would have expected you to do something about it. Especially after the flashy pursuit force you sent last time. I prefer not to act on unconfirmed rumors, Hyashi said, still not looking at him. This was honest truth. If he had believed half of the rumors that he had heard, then he would have been forced to disown Hanata several times over by now. Keisuke shrugged. Will you do anything now? It's the perfect chance. I am even more blind than normal and without my primary defense. Hyashi considered for a moment, then said, no. Not until I can guess your real motives. I had thought that you sought our destruction before, yet you fled and did not return, until now. The Hugo head turned to face his visitor. This time you come alone, 
and in weakness, yet your clumsy movements mask a sense of confidence that you did not have when you met me the first time. Perhaps you had no ill intentions before, but your aura. You were plotting something. He paused as Keisuke gave him a toothy smile, and Hyashi thought he caught a low chuckle. He came to another realization. You come to me unconcerned in your weakened state because you believe that you have already won. The smile on Keisuke's mouth was bordering on satanic as Hyashi said this. Not quite, said the blind man. But you're right. I am very confident. It's already begun. What has? Hyashi demanded, rising to his feet. When Haruka joined us, Keisuke said, seeming to ignore Hyashi's question, she explained that you had thought me some imitation, a hooligan masquerading as your ancient ancestor, Keisuke of the grave, trying to provoke Supersion. When she found us and wrote you about the Rokujuyon Road, your theory became far more advanced. Hyashi stared in surprise. So, Haruka was in league with you, after all? Yes, Keisuke replied. She has explained that you feared me, not for the Reud itself, although it is a potent counter to the Tenkutsu manipulation that your clan employs, but because the last person who possessed that ability tried to, and nearly did, incite a revolution within your ranks. You know the man of which I speak, he would have married your elder sister, if she had not been bee by the rotting bee. Hyashi stood stock still, old memory flashing in his eyes. Keisuke was correct, though at that point he had barely discovered the most basic of its uses. And he had been about to marry Hyashi's sister, against the wishes of all the elders and leaders in the clan, who had tried endless measures to stop him. Had she lived, the man would have been in a position to influence the clan. Hyashi didn't want to remember. The sad day fixed itself firmly in his mind, however, and he grew pale, his silver-white eyes reflecting in a turmoil. And still Keisuke spoke. You believed that I was the offspring of this man, come in the semblance of your long D ancestor to finish the work that his father began, thus undoing the work that Keisuke's runaway son, your clan's founder, completed. It was a good theory, I will admit. Hyashi found his voice, sped forward, and grabbed the blind man by the shirt, lifted him up off the rock. So, you are his unacknowledged son, and you plan to use Haruka too. He stopped, suddenly finding himself the subject of a blind gaze that he would have expected after kicking Keisuke's dog. I would sooner become your willing s than become one with that woman, besides, Haruka is no safer here than I am, so I wouldn't have any influence from that. As to being the son of your late sister's fiancé, the gaze turned into one of regret. There have been many times when I've wished it were, but my father was not Uzumaki. Unlikely as it seems, I am the true Keisuke of the grave. You lie, Hyashi said, the turmoil cresting within. The father of the first Hyuga is a frozen corpse, entombed in the farthest corner of the world. I know, my brother, Hisashi, found the sealed tomb, and we ourselves removed it from beneath this estate and brought it there. Keisuke chuckled, despite being manhandled by his distant descendant. So even then, when I was still a human popsicle, you feared me. You say that it is not possible for me to be alive, yet you removed me from here because you thought that it just might be true. Hyashi shook his head. This man was infuriating him. He'd have to deal with him before he lost control and did something drastic. But you don't have to fear me anymore, Hyashi. There's no way that I, skilled as I am with the road, can change your barbaric clan system by myself. I am not an Uzumaki, who carries both the power and the opportunity to get inside your house and alter it from within. That honor has been granted to another, and I, as well as Haruka, will see that he gives you another reason to be afraid. And it seems as though your out-of-control branch house might help us, too. Hyashi was about to deliver his jukin to the man's heart, when Keisuke puffed into smoke in his hands. Deceived, he thought. He did not return to his rock, but stood at that spot for several minutes, contemplating what it was that he had just heard. Is it truly possible? He asked no one even though Hisashi and I moved his tomb where nobody should have been able to follow. Has Haka no Keisuke really returned? Is Haruka, in fact, his ally against the clan? Hyashi-sama, came the call of an attendant, a message from your friend, Haruka. Hyashi accepted the letter from him and tore it open immediately. Hyashi, I am sorry. I know that you would have helped me if you could have. But the branch members have shown that they will not relent, thus explaining why you cannot help and also why I must side with Keisuke and with Naruto. Knowing my father's mistake, and how, through the house system, 
It cost our clan dearly, I cannot rest until I have redeemed him, and through redeeming him, redeemed myself. I want to tear down the walls and heal the rift between the two houses, in the hope that my father's guilt will be forgotten amid my success and the new Hugo unity. I want to live peacefully amidst my clan's folk again, and I know that Keisuke's plan can make it happen. This is not merely a notice of my defection, it is also a plea for your understanding and, hopefully, your help. I know that you take your responsibility to protect the Hugo secret seriously. I know that there is much pressure upon you from the elder Hugo already because of the acceptance of a weak girl as your heir, and that to push your luck by helping us will risk all that you have obtained in your leadership. Dot dot. But is it worth putting a curse upon our own brethren, forcing them to take hits for our leaders? Is it worth having more than half of us live in fear, afraid to speak against the system for fear of instant death through the seals on their foreheads, afraid of being chosen as a martyr for the Byakugan? Is it worth making people like myself and Neji doubt the worth of our own fathers? Keisuke will force you to take a side soon. I ask you to consider before you take the wrong one. Hyashi crumpled the letter and thrust it roughly back into the attendant's hands. I apologize, Haruka, he said. I chose my side when I accepted the leadership of this clan. Then he looked toward the pond, searching within the waters and the waning sunlight reflected upon it for some glimpse of the future, of what was to become of the fragile stability that the Hugo painstakingly maintained. Hanata, he thought, they plan to use her against me, against the clan system. And they will use Uzumaki Naruto to do it. That demon child, so at least some of the rumors I have heard about them are true. He grimaced, thinking of what might result from the chaos ahead. He had only recently accepted Hanata as his daughter, he did not want to lose her so soon afterward, especially not to the unstable container of Kyuubi. A Jinchuriki under the manipulative guidance of the great father of the first Hyuga. No, he reassured himself, it cannot be possible. The great father is most Asharasurd, and Hanata knows better than to court a young man without my permission. Haruka must have been brainwashed, hypnotized, or coerced in some way. I will find out what it is. For the first time since they had settled over the village, lightning thundered within the black clouds above. Boo. N.A. Naruto-kun. Hanata's breath caught in her chest, and the heat rose unbidden to her head. Fortunately, her door was closed and locked, it would not do to have anybody walk into her chamber and see the suspicious red face or the photo that had caused it. The photo in question, along with the several others that had been in the envelope, now lay before her on her bed, illuminated by the soft lamplight. It depicted Naruto in all his shinobi glory, and in very little else. Most of the others were similar images, though taken in different places. Naruto with his shirt torn to shreds, unleashing the raising an upon and off guard foe in an arena challenge. Naruto in a contest of strength, heaving a heavy barrel on his back and running to the finish line dressed only in boxer shorts decorated with blue sky and orange suns. Naruto meditating with Keisuke in a waterfall, covering himself with only his nine shining chakra, tails. Naruto passed out in a dumpster, with a ramen bowl over his delicates. Where this last one had come from, Hanata didn't think she wanted to ask, but other than that, the pictures were masterfully and tastefully taken. Haruka's words came back to her. If you're going to pass up the chance, I suppose I can at least offer you some consolation. As if this would help anyone forget a crush. These pictures were like an advertisement. Holding in her trembling hand the well-defined abdomen, the hard and muscular thighs, the compact yet powerful biceps, and the tanned skin bearing the occasional battle scar, which was worn proudly like a badge of honor, Hanata knew she was going to be having very wild dreams tonight, wild and explicit. Boo. Hugo Hanabi's thoughts and feelings about her older sister had never been stable. Rather, they were dynamic, changing with time as Hanata did. When Hanabi first learned to think as a sentient human being, she looked up to Hanata, who was a kind and soft-spoken, likable person. In those early days, the two sisters had shared a powerful, loving family bond. When their father began to express his disappointment at his older daughter's weakness, and begun focusing more on Hanabi's training, the youngest Hugo had watched her sister retreat into her own sad world, and had mixed feelings. Part of her pitied her beloved older sibling, wanted to reach out to her, help her out of the darkness. The other part of her felt elated at her superior ability, at how she was the one that father always paid attention to now. 
It was this latter part that took precedence in this era, as Hyashi had awarded her little time away from her training, he seemed to be trying to correct his mistakes with his new apprentice. Now that Hanata was in the spotlight again, and steadily improving on her way to the seat of power, Hanabi felt pressure to keep up. But also, she had noticed the change in her sister's attitude, the new positive, progressive drive that she had obtained. This drive brought Hanata into the height of her ability, and made Hanabi both jealous of and happy for her. They still rarely spoke to each other, both of them had extremely tight training schedules and missions still, and addressed each other stiffly and formally when they did meet, but no longer did Hanata cringe in fear and sadness in her presence, nor did Hanabi draw herself up haughtily and look upon her with pity when she passed. In short, their relationship was one of neutrality and understanding, thought with little actual contact. But each one cared enough for the other to know when something was amiss. Thus Hanabi, as generally the earliest riser in the house, knew that not all was in line when she heard Hanata hurriedly packing her gear within her room. Normally, her elder sister would have just finished her morning exercises with their cousin, Neji, and gone to breakfast. Yet today she had not. Probably a mission, Hanabi thought. Something, however, did not seem to be right, and Hanabi just couldn't put a finger on what it was. She pondered a moment, then decided that it had been a while since they had spoken anyway, and opened the door. Hanabi noticed with interest that Hanata, surprised at her unannounced entrance, looked around like a frightened deer and hurriedly closed her bedside drawer. Then, seeing that it was only her sister, she relaxed and turned to greet her. Ohio Gozimasu, Hanabi ne san. Ohio, Onizen, returned Hanabi. You'll be leaving on a mission today. Ah, no, not exactly. It is more like a, a favor that I am doing, for a very good friend, Hanata said. Hanabi considered, then decided it was believable. Hanata was popular these days, and had many friends in the village, not all of whom were shinobi, and Hanata was the type of kind person who would lend a hand to less able villages if she was asked. Hanabi herself had never seen Hanata gear herself up for such a favor, but then Hanabi rarely saw her in any circumstance, so perhaps this was a more regular occurrence than she surmised. Hanabi warmed inwardly, she always had admired her sister's capacity for kindness, which had persisted even in the days when Hanata was in more need of help than any of the people she gave it to. I see, she said, then turned away. Well, I don't want to be in your way, Onizen, and I have my own schedule to follow, so, I will take my leave. Hanata raised herself up, secured her pack to her shoulders, and moved for the door herself. She smiled cheerily at Hanabi, bid her good day and good luck, and left. Hanabi began moving off to the yard for her first solitary practice session. Then she had a thought, what was Onizen hiding in that drawer? If it was something to do with this, favor, wouldn't she have taken it with her? Curious, Hanabi retraced her steps and re-entered her older sister's room, crossed the floor to the other side of her bed, and opened the drawer. Squinting to see the contents in the dim light, she turned on the bedside lamp. And almost had her jaw hit the floor. She lifted the photographs from the drawer and flipped through them, astonished. Looking at each one, her face steadily became more colorful. Onizen. She was keeping this from us for how long? She stood in place for a long time, looking at the pictures over and over, cogs spinning rapidly in her brain, trying to understand. Onizen. She breathed. Then the cogs hit a snag and she wondered aloud, does father know? A deep voice behind her asked, do I know what, Hanabi? Ooh, you're L-A-A-A-A-T-E. Yeah, well, I had to spend the morning convincing Guy that he was a shinobi again, explained Kakashi. It wasn't far from the truth, Guy had, apparently, taken quite a liking to his, dynamic, alter ego, the civilian who had been rescued by Keisuke, and Kakashi had spent his morning trying to evade him so that he could go and buy Jiraiya's latest novel in peace before coming to the meeting spot. Liar, yelled Sakura. What a load of crap. Naruto exclaimed. Just because Ero Senen has time to write again doesn't mean you have an excuse make us wait two hours. What if S.A.'s, that bastard's already packed up and left? What would you say then, huh? Kakashi looked upon his two former students with a great smile on his masked face. It was the closest they had been to the good old days in almost three years. 
Naruto and Sakura berating him for tardiness, united in the first show of teamwork in Old Team 7 in ages, and the third member of the group regarding the exchange silently, without getting involved. Granted, Hanata didn't perfectly fill the role of the quiet, brooding, superiority complexing Uchiha, but she was most definitely better than nothing, and both Naruto and Sakura got along very well with her, which would certainly not be bad for their teamwork in this unofficial mission. Now remember, we don't even know if he's there, or even if he ever was, so said your tragic double, reminded the Junin. All we are doing is going in, finding out what we can, and getting out, we want to avoid combat if at all possible. I have a map of the facility from Anbu Records, this should be a quick and clean operation, if we don't run into any snags. HMPH, grunted Naruto, folding his arms and looking sternly at him. Still not an excuse for wasting our time. Kakashi, too happy to have his team back to be exasperated, motioned for them to follow him, then took off running into the forest. Ooh, it's dark, said Sakura, stepping down into the dank corridor from the hidden entrance. Should we light our gas torches? Sakura, that might be risky if anyone's home, said Naruto. If he is here, I don't want the bastard to know we're coming until we're on top of him, ready to bash his face in. That's probably right, she replied, impressed that Naruto was actually considering stealth as his first option rather than opting to charge in with all guns blazing, then hiding only when at a clear disadvantage. But even with the map, it will be difficult to find anything if we can't see. Anno, I might be able to help, said Hanata. Practice had improved her mastery of the Byakugan to the point where she could see fairly well even in the very faintest of light. Except in a sealed room with no light at all, Hanata was never blinded. The light from the entrance would be sufficient for a long ways into the dungeon. She focused her chakra and snapped on her dujutsu. Byakugan. Oh, you can see even when it's this dark, Hanata. Said Naruto. Amazing. Luckily, it was too dark for Naruto to see, or he might have worried that she was growing ill because of her near-luminous red face. Ah, I see, said Sakura, so you can help Kakashi-sensei navigate this place for us, huh, Hanata-chan. A good thing, since it would be bad for me to try to use my Sharingan and waste my chakra, remarked Kakashi. Well, you lead the way then, Hanata. Hi, I will. Pleased to be of such help to her two friends, Hanata took the map and began leading them on, silently as possible, to the heart of the once abandoned lair. All of the members of the team moved without sound and, knowing the great importance of the mission, with a great tensity. Their old comrade grew closer with each step they took. Ooh, it's empty, Hanata said, breaking the long silence. They had reached the door to the main laboratory, and Hanata had peered as far through it as she could, checking for any sign of activity. Stay frosty, said Kakashi. It may not be entirely abandoned, and if it is, it may still be trapped. I got it, sensei, said Naruto. He pushed on the heavy door, but it did not budge. He tried again, harder, still to no avail. He had his ear in Kakashi's direction. Should I? Kakashi pondered, then asked, Hanata, you're sure there's nothing alive in there? Hi, Kakashi sensei. He sighed. This would give away the cover, but they wouldn't learn anything otherwise. Durit, Naruto. The swirling ball of chakra took form in Naruto's hand, filling the stone hallway with its flickering blue light. With a hard forward thrust, the blonde brought its force to bear on the heavy door. Raisingan, Sakura, Kakashi, and Hanata took cover behind Naruto as the door was ground to pieces, sending stone chips flying everywhere. When the dust cleared, all was as quiet, no alarm sounded, no warning lights blared, no punji trap dropped from the ceiling to skewer them, and nothing exploded. It was as silent as a tomb. Well, Kakashi said, if there is anyone here, they'll know about us by now. Sakura lit a torch. Well if that's the case, then we ought to look around quickly, before they get here. Hanata and Kakashi also lit the gas torches, and Naruto called forth his nine tails of light, illuminating the chamber in soft blue. As he strode into the room, he put them before himself, waving them through the air, along the ground, the ceiling, and the walls, testing for traps everywhere he went. Seems safe enough, he said. The others followed, and they began to take stock of their surroundings. The room was fairly small, certainly not a place to breed hundreds of Naruto clones. On the main table, however, there was the corpse of a pale-skinned young man with dark hair, 
The spitting image of NO234 as Naruto had last seen him. The body was strapped to the table and spread eagled, an expression of agony on its face. Apparently, the clone had D in a final test of the product's durability. On the walls, there were many charts, varying statistics for this sample or that, measuring results for changes in one variable or another, a single chart for every week of experimentation. They went back at least for 12 weeks. So, Sasuke had been plotting his clone assault for at least three months before it actually hit, Kakashi mused. I wonder what purpose it had, other than to cause chaos and confusion in the village. Sakura asked. I don't know. Maybe Orokimaru wanted to see how strong we truly are. Or maybe, Hanata put in, in the confusion, they were trying to complete some other objective. That makes a little sense, said Naruto thoughtfully, but I haven't gotten wind of anyone or anything important D or missing. Oh, maybe it was a diversion so that they could infiltrate our secret places, and just set up for the next move. Kakashi nodded. A logical explanation, Naruto. There are many places in Kanoa that one could hide, and not all of them are known to our people. Getting to some of these places, like clan compounds, concealed basements in shops, etc., while the shinobi patrols are unhindered might indeed be difficult for more than one person. Perhaps whatever scheme is in the making requires that multiple agents be in place in multiple positions. Wow, you figured that out on your own, Naruto. Sakura asked. The new Naruto was making a better and better impression on her. He he. I didn't hang around such smart people like Keisuke Nisan and Haruka Nei-chan for two years without profit, you know. Naruto beamed at her. Then, for no conscious reason, he turned and beamed at Hanata. Ah, she said, seeing the almost expectant look on his face, yes, it was very clever of you, Naruto-kun. For some reason, Naruto felt very satisfied at that comment. He'd felt satisfied at having Sakura's acknowledgement, but this seemed to boost his ego even more. At any rate, Kakashi continued, it doesn't look like Sasuke is here. Probably he or one of his officers used to be, coordinating the attack. But it seems abandoned now, they have no more use for the Naruto clones. Naruto hung his head. Damn it, he said. I thought for sure we'd find some clue to where he's hiding. Don't give up, Naruto, said Sakura, there's got to be some evidence somewhere. We're just looking in the wrong place. Her face was set in grave determination. She had waited long enough, and this, at least, was some progress. That's right, Naruto-kun, said Hanata encouragingly, I'm sure there are plenty of clues in the village, hiding under our noses. I, I can help you find them. Naruto's head perked back up, looking less pained. Yeah, I guess so. Thanks, Sakura. Thank you, Hanata. I'll stay here, do a little more sniffing around, Kakashi said. Kuchio's no jutsu. A pack of nin dogs materialized in the dark room, and their noses twitched, already picking up the strange and unfamiliar scents in the air. You guys head back up to the surface. There isn't much left you can do here. Naruto's face betrayed one last pang of frustration, then settled into its usual confident, determined expression. All right, Kakashi-sensei. Let us know if you find anything weird. Ooh. Outside the entrance to the facility, the three teenage shinobi discussed the next move. If you're right, Naruto, then he could be anywhere in the village right now, sighed Sakura. This meant a lot of searching to do, more searching than they could accomplish in a day without arousing suspicion. It's all right. We'll definitely find him. I can get Keisuke and Haruka to lend us their help, and maybe Ero Senen if he's still in town. Plus, we have Hanata's help, that'll speed up the searching a lot. Naruto-kun, said Hanata, proud that she could be so useful to them, I'll do everything I can. My best effort. Naruto gave her his trademark fox-like grin, saying, I know, Hanata. We all will, for that dumb bastard sake. For now, Sakura suggested, we should split up and look casually around different areas in the village. It would be too suspicious if we all walked around together with our eyes peeled wide. Yes, put in Hanata, that is probably a good idea. She stopped when she saw the gleam in Sakura's eye. She knew what was coming, she could recognize that sadistic look anywhere. Then, Hanata, said Sakura in a voice that was almost sickeningly sweet, why don't you take Naruto and go look in the center part of the village? You might meet up with Keisuke-san there, too, and give him the news. 
Hanata reacted predictably, light blushing, deer in the headlights eyes, hesitation to respond. It was a hesitation that invited interruption. Unfortunately, said a voice from behind them, Hanata Sama must decline, as she will be coming with us. The voice belonged to a Hugo branch member, one of three who had silently appeared at their backs. He regarded them with a straight face, critical silver eyes, and an authoritative posture. His voice had a commanding timbre, and the regal-looking robes that he wore enhanced the image of authority. Naruto, having never been one to heed authority just because the possessor wore fancy clothes, replied in his standard manner, with a question. A. Why not? The branch house captain shifted his gaze to the QB's jailer, and that gaze turned cold. He looked at Naruto with a glare that said, get out of the way, little fox devil. Naruto recognized the look and glared back with eyes that read, make me, big talker. You don't scare me. The captain answered in a tone equally calm as before, Hanata-sama has urgent business to attend to at home. Hyashi samas orders. Hanata stepped forward. Thank you, Captain Hiroto. Please tell my father that I will return shortly. I'm afraid, Hanata-sama, that is not possible, replied the captain sternly. Hyashi-sama sent us with orders to return with you at once, and to accept no other response than total cooperation. Oh, Hanata said simply. Then she asked, why? We will leave now, Hanata-sama, said Captain Hiroto, ignoring the question. He clasped Hanata's arm and lurched forward. Hanata gave a small yelp and struggled in his grip. Hey, Naruto shouted, causing him to turn to him again. Is that any way to treat your future leader? I don't think so. Seeing the menacing glare in Hiroto's eyes, Sakura nudged her teammate. Hey, Naruto, don't you think it would be safer not to bother with those Hyuga? They look like they mean business. So what? Naruto retorted angrily, they waltz in, all high and mighty, boss around the next ruler, and just yank her off like that without telling her why. Sorry, but that doesn't fly with me. They don't respect their own superiors, so why should I respect them? Hanata's face was pale with fear. They were branch houses, but Hiroto's team was the best among them. Hyashi's elite guard, each one the equal of any three junin level ninja in the village. Only the Anbu were tougher, and Hiroto was on par with them. Naruto-kun, she said, it's all right, really. No, it's not. It's obvious you don't want to go with them, at least not without being told why. You have a right to know why you're being called off, and the right to get there on your own two feet rather than being dragged around like a rag doll. Naruto spat on the ground, a show of open defiance against the branch captain. A long, tense moment passed where the two stared each other down, Naruto's iron will clashing with the cold confidence and power of Hiroto. Finally, the captain half flung Hanata back toward her friends. Are you satisfied now, young devil? Hell no, said Naruto. Now you need to apologize for mistreating your superior. She is not my commander yet, boy. Hiroto's gaze was cold steel piercing into Naruto's heart. Doesn't matter, replied Naruto, even if she isn't she's still human. Nobody deserves to be handled like that. Hanata flushed, both in admiration for the blonde shinobi and out of fear for his life. Hiroto's patience only went so far, and she had seen him severely injure Junin level shinobi, nearly to the point of death, when he was angered. Naruto-kun. Naruto. Sakura, Hanata, you leave this jerk to me. Nobody's going to treat my friend like that and go unpunished. Not while I'm alive. Hiroto stood silent for a few seconds, then motioned for his subordinates to back down. They did so, hesitantly. One of them looked at him nervously. Captain. Stay back, he replied. I don't need your corpse piled on top of the brats here by accident. He slid easily into his duke and stance, facing Naruto with hate in his eyes. You will have your wish, boy. Defend yourself, if you can. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.